I'm Gregory Floyd, President of Local 237 Teamsters. With us, a very special guest on Reaching Out for the first time, newly, newly I would say, appointed Executive Officer of the Legal Aid Society, Twyla Carter. She's the attorney in chief, making her first, making her the first black woman and first Asian American to lead the organization in its 148th year history. Prior to joining the Legal Aid Society, Carter was the national director of legal and policy at the Bail Project which is a national nonprofit and that pioneered a movement to bring free bail assistance to pre-trial and pre-trial support to thousands of low-income people every day. Twyla has also served as a senior staff attorney at the American Civil Liberties Union, that's ACLU, where she prosecuted against local and state bail inequities and the right to counsel protections, and many more unfairness in legal practices. Prior to working at the ACLU, Twyla was a public defender for 10 years, which included as misdemeanor practice director of the Kings County Department of Public Defense in Seattle. Twyla received an associate's degree from Seattle Central Community College and a bachelor's degree from Seattle University, summa cum laude, and a JD from the Seattle School of Law. Twyla currently resides in Brooklyn where all the cool people live <laughs> and were born. <laughs> a little plug for myself. <laughs> Welcome to Reaching Out. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me ask you, how how's the adjustment that you have practicing law on the West Coast as and the East Coast. Tell us the differences before I get into questions. That's a good question. I um, So I'm a West Coast girl, I will say that, but New York and Brooklyn are my new home. But Seattle is actually home for me. I moved here from LA. So the West Coast is very different than the East Coast, as you know. Um, the, the style and approach is different. I, I, I think that folks on the West Coast <laughs> think I'm <laughs> too abrasive. So uh, I think I, I fit in nicely here on the East Coast, although there's a little bit of a myth there too. I think people are really nice in New York um, unless or until they're behind the wheel of a car. Oh. And, and then you see the, the New Yorker, <laughs> true, the true <laughs> New Yorker come out. But otherwise, you know, it is different on both coasts. I, I had the pleasure of working in, in what would be, I guess, known as blue states, blue jurisdictions. They still are riddled with the same issues, actually. Uh, the West Coast, obviously, you can't move around the same way that you do here. The, the systems are set up differently as well. But all in all, you have the same values, the same goals that are being achieved. And so it's been an honor and a pleasure to be now here on, on the East Coast and working in a dream job. Oh, very good. So... Where does the Legal Aid Society fit into that uh, conversation? Uh, the conversation would be, they are often the first thing you hear New Yorkers mention when they talk about the future of our city and state. So where does the Legal Aid Society fit into that conversation? I appreciate that question. So first, you know, everyone who works at the Legal Aid Society is a New Yorker, lives and works in our communities. All of us want to live in safe neighborhoods, make it to and from work without any issues on the train, et cetera, just like everyone else. Public safety is extremely important to us and we are uniquely qualified to talk about smart and effective criminal justice efforts because we represent the people who are accused of committing crimes, everything from shoplifting to murder. So the Legal Aid Society and public defenders throughout the city, the state and the entire country, actually, we fulfill a constitutional requirement in the Sixth Amendment which states that anyone, regardless of income, who faces criminal charges has the right to effective assistance of counsel. And this is as fundamental and American as apple pie. Uh, the vast majority of the people that we serve at Legal Aid Society come from low income communities of color, neighborhoods that have been long starved of economic opportunity and access to quality education, blocks that have 
really shouldered the brunt of over-policing and other systemic inequities. And so it is our job as public defenders to advocate for people who are accused of a crime, to represent them in courts, in communities, in Albany, lend them a voice, give them a meaningful opportunity to be heard. And not just, we don't just represent low-income New Yorkers in criminal cases, but we also fight the long-standing inequities that have plagued our system for decades, whether it's NYPD misconduct or the horrors that we keep hearing about on Rikers Island. We serve as that check and balance in the criminal legal system. But I want to be clear, though, as well, that we're more than just public defenders. We also handle uh, civil matters, everything from housing to immigration, employment, education, for example, just to name a few. We also represent young New Yorkers in delinquency cases, foster care proceedings, and other matters. We have 41 different units from tax to public benefits to DNA. We serve hundreds of thousands of people every single year, and with our advocacy and, and strategic litigation efforts, actually we impact millions, and that is our footprint here in New York City. Now, you know, this, this brings a, a question to my interesting. How do you determine who you represent, and how do people get in contact with you to ask you to represent them? You know, that's a really great question. Um, our cases come to us... A, from numerous means, through either court appointment, through intake, because someone has done an intake with us in housing, for example, they've come to court and it's our day to take members of the public and take cases in that way. We can get them assigned uh, through other, other um, entities as well, whether it's the court or whether it's through our contracts. Um, but typically, Across the board, you have to be a low income New Yorker. We also have an access to benefit line. So I, I'll give that helpline uh, number out for folks who may need it. It's 1-888-663-6880. Again, the access to benefit helpline is 888-663-6880 uh, because unfortunately we are unable to take every single case that comes our way. The needs are so great, the mandates are huge but you do have to be low income to become our client. And I will just be very clear because when we're talking about criminal justice, uh, which is what we started with here at the top of the hour, all it takes to become the client of a public defender is someone accuses you of a crime. That's it. Now, uh, of course you have a website also if people- We do, yes, absolutely. And of course we want people to go to that website, Legal Aid Society, we're in New York City please go check us out. Again, we have 41 different units. We're in all five boroughs. We have over 2,200 staff and attorneys that work here. Again, we handle hundreds of thousands of cases and impact millions in all five boroughs and courts in Albany and in the community. Now, are you a nonprofit organization? Yes, we are 501c3. So we certainly are you know, challenged in the same way that many nonprofits are with regards to funding and resources and the way the contract procurement system works here in New York City. But yes, we are. Okay. If somebody wanted to donate to your organization, how would they do that? They would contact us via the website again. So we would love to have people come to our website, Legal Aid Society. We're in New York City and uh, we have ways to contribute online, certainly. Okay. Very good. So why, why, do, we, why do we need public defenders? Well, that is an excellent question. Um, you know, we need public defenders because we are the folks that, again, who stand in the gap of injustice when someone is accused of a crime. Uh, the fundamental rights to resumption of innocence, the due process rights that we all have and share. Um, public defenders are the only profession that's covered by this, the United States Constitution and the Sixth Amendment. Anyone who's accused of a crime, and if you are low income, you are entitled to effective assistance of counsel. So certainly folks who have access to money and resources certainly would hire a lawyer for anything that they need. Folks who are low income do not have that luxury, but pursuant to the United States Constitution, um, our job exists for the sole purpose of representing and protecting the rights of people who are indigent. Okay. You're, you're just finishing your second full year as the head of the Legal Aid Society. What's your biggest accomplishment so far? It's a great question. Again, as I said, you know, this is a dream job and I'm really blessed to have it. The folks who work here at Legal Aid Society are some of the most dedicated people I've had the honor of working with. 
But you know, to your point, the criminal legal system cannot function without public defenders. But the unfortunate truth is that here in New York, we do not pay our staff and attorneys uh, what they're worth. The NYPD budget alone, just for example, is 30 times the budget we have. And that's just to get to the point of an arrest. They have 30 times the budget that we have for the entire criminal legal system and beyond even doing post-conviction work that we do. And that does not include the budgets for the prosecutors, the courts, and corrections. So my top priority has been fighting for the city and state funding that we need to make sure that our staff and attorneys can continue to do the great work that they do on behalf of low-income New Yorkers. And I'm really proud to have made progress in that area. We must have adequate funding and resources to ensure that fundamental doctrines, again, like the presumption of innocence and due process are fully protected. And our fight for funding fairness includes securing increased funding to pay our staff a livable wage that they deserve, one that is commiserate with the marketplace, and one that also ensures that our technology and other systems are up to date and cutting edge. Funding fairness for us also includes changing the onerous and inefficient contract procurement system that I talked about earlier uh, that burdens all nonprofit organizations in the city. And so while we're not all the way there yet, we have made some gains in both Albany and in City Hall to finally address the years of divestment that we have endured and that have plagued our organization to bring us now into this century. So we've been able to increase some staff compensation, fill some much needed vacancies and more. And so this is my proudest accomplishment and will remain my priority heading into my third year. You know, a thought came to me while you were uh, uh, talking. Uh, I would imagine you have a lot of staff that have student loans. Absolutely. And from, you say that some of them, a lot of them not paid the wages that they could earn, say, in private law firms. Right. It's really a labor of love to do uh, legal aid society work and have student loans that you have to pay that only multiply and the interest get get um, larger and larger. So I um, mean, my hat goes off to everyone who is working in, in your organization, especially those who have student loans, because it's like a never ending battle that you have to pay student loans. And if you work in a legal aid society long enough, you I don't, I don't know if you ever pay off those loans. That's absolutely right. And I'm really happy that you brought that up actually because that is a very important point you know those of us that decide to go to law school to begin with you have choices to make you can go into private counsel you can go to a law firm you can you know work for google you could become a prosecutor you could do all sorts of things it, here on our side for folks who choose to again take up the mantle for low-income people who are accused of a crime or we have folks here that work in our civil practice because we don't just do criminal defense here we also have a civil practice and we also have a juvenile rights family court practice as well both of them very robust and doing amazing work all have have lawyers to your point that have taken on student loan and student debt because uh, they've dedicated their lives to serving poor communities and so this is actually one area that our union has been extremely active in AOAA a chapter has been extremely uh, vocal about what they're enduring and what we have been up against with regards to our wages and trying to pay people salaries that not only allow them to live in the most expensive city in the country, let alone the world, allow them to also be able to pay for childcare, allow them to take much needed vacations. But to your point, undergirding all of that are bills, including student loans that are saddling people, especially people of color, people who come from lower uh, income communities to begin with who wanna to come to this work to represent uh, their community and uh, find that that it's a challenge when you come and work here and we can't pay you top dollar and you do have those loans. So there was a bill recently that our union worked with us on in coalition, the Hesk Dolph bill that we looked to try to have the state increase the amounts that are being contributed into that fund. And unfortunately, it didn't make it all the way over the finish line, but you know, hopefully with more attention to this issue and thank you again for bringing it up and huge shout out again to our union chapter of ALAA, our attorney union for taking up the mantle on this fight and our, our 
legal aid liaison in particular, Jane Fox, for really leading the charge on that particular issue. I'm Gregory Floyd, President of Local 237, and you're listening to Reaching Out with us, a very special guest, Twyla Carter. Uh, she is the attorney in chief and chief executive officer of the Legal Aid Society, and we're talking about uh, Legal Aid Society and um, the work, that, the great work that they do. Uh, what else? What else have you uh, done? What else are you proud of? You know, we've been able to accomplish a lot in the two years that I've been here, building on the rich history of the 146 years when I arrived. We're now nearly 150 years old. Part of our job also involves, you know, holding elected officials accountable, which is a fundamental right in our country. So, you know, here at the Legal Aid Society, we don't pull our punches. When something needs to be corrected, we take action. So something else that we are uh, proud of, I am proud of, is the legislative efforts that we have made, the advocacy and policy work that we have done. So, for example, in Rikers, right now, we are pushing for a federal receivership over the city's jail system. Rikers, um, as you know, and, and your listeners know, is broken. And this administration just does not have the willingness or ability to stop the widespread suffering for people who are waiting for their trial to happen. So again, people who are not yet convicted of a crime are sent to Rikers. And people who have been dying at Rikers have not yet been convicted of a crime. So I really want that to sink in so people understand the, the importance of what we talk about when we talk about uh, Rikers jail and that system being broken. It's beyond time to bring someone else in. And so we have been pushing strongly for an independent body such as a receiver who is not going to be bound by the politics or other interests, certainly at the city level, but who would be reporting directly to the federal court. We believe that only that independent body would be able to turn around what's happening at Rikers. So we're in court right now on this issue and we'll make our case in front of the judge again in September. So that's one uh, area that we've been working on that I'm very proud of. I'm also very proud of the work that we've been doing to take Mayor Adams and his administration to task, quite honestly, over the NYPD's policing of protests. Uh, last fall, we worked with the state attorney general, Letitia James, and the NYCLU, New York Civil Liberties Union, to announce a historic settlement, which completely overhauls how the NYPD uh, polices protests. It prohibits certain tactics that they're able to use, um, including uh, kettling, and it implements a tiered system, a four-tiered system that requires the NYPD to use de-escalation methods before increasing its presence. Uh, another area that I'm very proud of the work that we're doing is around housing, as you know, fundamental right. Uh, imagine you know, not being able to lay your head down in a safe and warm place. So around housing, we're in court to also compel the administration to fully implement the city FEPS program, which is a local housing voucher program. The city council enacted a package of legislation to reform and expand it, uh, the city FEPS program, but city hall has uh, refused to endorse it. So we took them to court over that decision. And you know this deprives people experiencing or on the brink of homelessness, which is a critical lifeline. And we're hoping that the court rules in our favor. There are many, many other examples I can give you of the great work that has been done, but I'll, I'll end this question, I guess, on this example with our victory that ensures that the city processes applications for SNAP and cash benefits in accordance with federal law. So due to a number of varying factors, these applications were just languishing for far too long and people were being cut off from buying their food, prescriptions, and other critical needs. We have sued and now the administration is doing better but this is just you know, a small sliver of the work that we have to do to hold our elected and appointed officials accountable. Uh, what can the city and state do to improve conditions in NYCHA, the New York City Housing Authority for residents? Because I know you're uh, involved in NYCHA. That's right. So, you know, the Public Housing Preservation Trust is a game changer for NYCHA residents, and it's something that we fought for last year. As you know, NYCHA needs um, over $78 billion to fully restore and renovate all of its buildings. But the federal government has provided only a fraction of the funding that's needed 
to make these improvements. So many of the conditions that we see in NYCHA buildings are unacceptable, they're unsafe for residents and their, their families, and the renovations are long overdue. Some critics contend that it's privatization, but let me be very clear. The trust is 100% public. So NYCHA owns, controls, manages the property. There's no private manager and NYCHA employees will continue to be employed by NYCHA. It remains the permanent owner of the land and buildings and it enters into a long-term ground lease with the trust to secure Section 8 vouchers, which is a subsidy worth double NYCHA's current federal subsidy. So this, this is a big deal. Similar to how other government entities raise revenue for capital improvements, for example, the trust will issue bonds that fund comprehensive building renovations with input and partnership from residents at the development. The trust can also hire better vendors who can complete high quality work and they can do it faster. And I can say that the Nostrand Houses in Sheep's Head Bay, Brooklyn was the first to join the trust and we hope that others will follow suit. Well, I'm, I'm kind of smiling because full disclosure, um, the Preservation Trust was brought by um, Gregory Russ who retired. And prior to the housing trust coming into effect, we at the union went up to Cambridge, Massachusetts in 2015, because we were invited there by uh, John Murphy, who's a Teamster president, to show us how the housing authority in, in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts operates. And what we found was they had something similar and they didn't call it the trust, but they operated the um, Cambridge Housing Authority, which at the time it was Mayor de Blasio, grew up seven blocks away, seven miles away from where that was taking place. And we saw in real time how they renovated, renovated the entire housing authority, right. keeping the employees, the unionized employees in place, leveraging the private money with public money, and the residents were not displaced. Gregory Russ was the gentleman who was in charge of that housing authority who started that, but later went to Minnesota. We insisted that we had put in our contract the Cambridge model. Mm -hmm. We had that in our contract, but at the time, Mayor de Blasio had no intentions on doing that. When Gregory Russ came to New York City, he said he wanted to do what he did in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and he was told he couldn't do it. So he read the union contract. He said, well, the union has it in their contract. Why can't I do it? And that's how we started on the road to having the preservation trust. He called me in. He said, we're not going to do the Cambridge model, but I'd like you to support us in doing um, a model for New York City that's similar. And he created the trust board. And we were all in favor. And then the, there were a lot of apprehension about this project but I ensured everybody, but we saw it work in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Now that was nine years ago. So when you say you support it for the reasons why, I'm glad I didn't prompt you to say that. You didn't know I was gonna respond that way. I did not. You didn't know the history. Right. But I totally understand what the preservation trust means for the residents in housing. And I would urge more housing authority developments to join the Preservation Trust. I say trust the trust because that's the future of nature. I really appreciate that endorsement. That's a ringing endorsement for this trust, for uh, the direction that we are headed. And you're right, it's, it's a model that works. It's a model that will allow uh, people to stay in their homes longer. And it's certainly a game changer, like I said, for NYCHA residents. So really appreciate that. You're right, we did not plan this ahead of time. So it's great to, to hear that the Teamsters are, are on the same page with us on that. That's great. And I would say rental assistance development, which is named RAD. I say RAD is bad. RAD is privatization. RAD is bad. Trust to trust, RAD is bad. And that's how I would say. So, uh, we have uh, just a few seconds. I just want to say thank you for coming on. You've been very informative. 
Twyla, Carter, anytime you're willing to come on and discuss any issue pertaining to what you know that's important that people need to hear and understand, you're welcome to come back to reaching out. We have a standing invitation. I appreciate that so much. Thank you again for the opportunity. Really appreciate it. And I will take you up on that. So I look forward to seeing you all again in the future. I'm Gregory Floyd, President of Local 237. This has been another edition of Reaching Out. A very special guest was Twyla Carter, Chief CEO of the Legal Aid Society. Thank you for coming on.